All right, welcome, Bunky. You're still hanging out with us right here on Why in the Morning. The hashtag to plug in on is Why in the Morning everywhere on all our social media platforms. And now is that time that we take a look at uh, the newspapers or the dailies, as we call it. And uh, we're going to take a look at the People Daily. And the splash or the, uh, the news headline or the highlight is uh, uh, for CSS list risk rejection. And uh, this is after the vetting of the 22 um, nominated, uh, let's say nominated CSS by uh, President William Ruto uh, came to a close last week on Saturday. And uh, after the interviews, actually, it was literally an interview to actually vet and see their capacity in terms of human professionalism, integrity as well, and uh, many other, you know, items that were considered to actually vet them to see if they hold water to actually uh, deserve uh, the sports as CSS. And then uh, the main highlights in this, in that, that possibly could uh, might be maybe be met with rejection is uh, Moses Kuria, who they say his opponents have zeroed in on his past conduct saying he is not suitable for a cabinet role and then we have Penaina Malonza uh, they say those who want her rejected her saying that she did not demonstrate understanding of what her docket entails uh, you can see right there you have it on top of your skin all right, there they say Penaina Malonza. Uh, those who wanted her rejected her, saying that she did not demonstrate understanding of what her docket entails. And then we also had Mithika Linturi, whose headshot is like the top of the, that chain. They say his critics say he has too many court cases, 35 in all, and he should get them out of the way first. Of course, he had graft allegations as well. Uh, sexual assault misconduct allegedly and then we also had Aisha Juma whose opposition legislator say that she has pending criminal case and a protest DPP's attempt to drop it of course she has also been accused of graft allegations swindling up to around uh, 20 million is it 50 million or 19 million 20 million county government funds allegedly so uh, that's another top highlight on the splash of the people daily and then on top of that we have tough questions over the killing of pakistan scribe just above uh, the splash tough questions over the killing of pakistan scribe the story is on page number six uh, literally this is uh, a journalist a pakistan journalist who was murdered on magadi road uh, last week last weekend and uh, there's been a lot of speculations around it whether it's the special service unit or it's the country, his country that murdered, that murdered him. Of course, he was an investigative journalist who was on his mission to uncover very sensitive uh, details about, you know, his government as well. And initially, he had received uh, life threats and death threats from, you know, his government as well. So uh, that's a story also that we'll be taking a look. It's on page number six. Um, at the corner of that, we have how families are coping with the rising cost of goods. Households have cut back on spending only buying essentials as they seek side jobs is uh, another interesting story about you know the cost of living right now in the country uh, prices of small items or as I say commodities are super high or in other words they are hiked and uh, we are also still calling on the government even as the drought continues to uh, advancely ravage uh, different communities that have been uh, painfully uh, affected by the drought situation in the country. Still, the cost of living is high. The economy is still hard pinching. And we're still waiting to see if uh, the current regime is going to make a shift to a different tangent as well. And then below that, uh, leader with Kenyan roots takes charge as British Prime Minister. This is uh, Rish, Rish Sunak. Whose father, by the way, uh, is, uh, is Kenyan and is in, was born in Nakuru and is now the first British Asian, first Hindu and wealthiest man to occupy the 10th Downing Street. That story is on page number three. Uh, really excited to wait. Of course, there's a lot of conversations on that one as well on Twitter. If you are an ardent um, user of social media, and I think it, it, it's, it's, it's also still a national story that uh, we'll be taking center stage for the better part of this week to see if he's exactly going to bag it or uh, there'll be other developments as well, if that's a story to go by. Now, uh, let's go to uh, page number two. We shall go in that order, the People Daily on uh, page number two. 
that says uh, China hints at willingness to restructure Kenyan loans. And this is another, another again, groundbreaking story about, you know, the debt that we owe to China. And uh, if at all we will manage to have it paid or cleared on time, how many years should we give our current regime to ensure that, you know, they clear? And if at all, if, that, if that's anything to go by, when will we clear it? And then the Chinese government has hinted at uh, willingness to discuss a loan, loan uh, structure of program with Kenya, even, if, even as it affirmed the continued uh, cordial working with the new administration for both countries. Chinese ambassador to Kenya, Zhu Pingyan, yesterday said that they work within the terms laid down, assuring that all the government has been doing is to honor requests from all partners that they work with. The ambassador also assured that his country is willing to listen, discuss, and improve cooperation with Kenya as eco-partners and affirming that implementation depends on the specific programs, but China has no reservations. And then just jump below, down below that, they say uh, that is about traditional friendships with China, of course, with Kenya. Kenya and China enjoy profound traditional friendships, and both countries are confident in the new leadership under Xi Jinping and William Ruto to boost partnerships. In as much as you know, we have you know, um, the debt, we are still in partnership with uh, Kenya. And then they've explained China is willing also to partner with, to boost new industrialization processes and we encourage more and more Chinese companies and investors to expand uh, their businesses in Kenya to create jobs to China and even Kenya as well. And then China does pursue a trade surplus with Kenya, hence the need to encourage the Chinese company to import more from Kenya. And uh, you definitely realize that, you know, um, there's a lot of projects that we have in our country that um, actually, uh, that are actually, you know, that have been spearheaded by China as well, or China in partnership with Kenya. So we are still following, it, following up on that one as well to see if it's going to lead to a good end. Is it the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning for that debt? It's a question that we can continue to ask ourselves as we live in this country. Now, um, another interesting story <clears throat> is on page uh, number three. I don't know if we are, uh, yes, it will be coming shortly on top of your screen. Politician with Kenyan roots is named as British Prime Minister, and that is Rishi Sunak, who I just mentioned that, you know, he is Kenyan born and precisely in Nakuru. Rishi Sunak enjoys links with Kenya. Be, uh, of course, yesterday he became prime minister after being chosen by the conservatives to govern uh, the country. Sunak, who is also of Indian descent, re replaces Liz Truss, who resigned last week. Liz Truss resigned last week. Of course, it was another national groundbreaking story. And uh, just after in being in power for only 45 days, and his ascension to office was historic as he became the first prime minister of color to occupy the office. And in his acceptance speech, Sunak, who is aged 42 years old, he said he addressed the nation at the Conservatives' headquarters in London and thanked the ruling party for expressing confidence in his leadership. And he said, quote, unquote, I will serve you with integrity and humility. That's uh, what he actually mentioned in part of his speech. He will become the prime minister on Monday after other candidates quit the race to lead Conservative Party, leaving him with the task of steering a deeply divided country through an economic downtown to set millions of people poorer. So Nak's rise to actually leadership is uh, Britain faces serious economic challenges, including needs for stability and unity. And, uh, and his speech, as well as I mentioned, he said, is going to be his first uh, items to actually have a revolution of or have a change on. He also, he's also a former finance minister who has been left with the task of steering a deeply divided country through that economic downturn. It's not just even not only Kenya uh, that is facing an, um, an economic nose dive or an economic downturn. So we also have um, other global countries as well that are going through that economic recession. And then uh, Sunak's only challenger or challenger, the person, the contestant that he's facing is Penny Mordaunt, who is the leader of the House of Commons and former defense minister, was uh, reportedly back 
was reported back by 30 members of parliament compared with nearly 150 supporters by Sunak. So he has like amassed himself quite a huge uh, following and he has managed to actually win the trust of uh, the netizens right there. So definitely it's a, such an interesting story as well to be following up. Sunak ho has also a daunting task of studying British politics following the re resignation of, 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 of uh, Liz Strauss and uh, the area thereafter he wants he went to Stanford that was yesterday where he earned his first MBA. The former finance chief uh, led the Conservative Party's race to replace Liz Truss as Prime Minister on Sunday as he garnered public support of over 100 Tory lawmakers. You know, when it comes to even understanding the politics of the UK, uh, I feel like it's, it's, it's one of the first world countries that we also depend on as well. And we have seen a lot of even our nurses, not just nurses, even teachers as well. And so many people have money to like, you know, go to the UK to eck a living for themselves. It's one of the most, you know, um, uh, 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 first world countries that, you know, has a lot of Kenyans actually earning a living and working there peacefully. So we hope even this relationship as uh, Rishi Sunak is becoming prime minister, uh, we're going to have uh, very close, uh, tight, tight economic relationships as well to ensure that, you know, even we boost our lifestyle right here in Kenya. Now, just to sum it up, they say a possible return to power for the 58-year-old, that is Boris Johnson, who also resigned. And then the question is, why do they keep on resigning? We had Boris Johnson, who was the former prime minister, resigned. And then recently we had Liz Truss, who also resigned. What, what could be the problems that are festering in the UK's uh, leadership system? Is it because of uh, maybe economic downturn or I mean, maybe lack of support or just some other factors that are not making the leadership system coherent is a question that we are also we are seeking answers right here in Kenya as well. And uh, he says uh, he had deeply conv divided conservatives and brought up unpredictability to the rest. Even Johnson supporters have said he is a vote winner and he had enough backing from another Johnson am administration that would be uh, disastrous for the party and uh, the country. Uh -huh. He also sparked anger in her party and weeks of financial turmoil. So basically, I think they're trying to highlight to us that, you know, there's a possibility of, you know, an economic and also a political, you know, misfunction where, you know, there's lack of coherence. They're not understanding each other. And then, you know, leading such a multinational country that, you know, is looked upon is like almost like a superpower. It's like the U.S. now because... When you actually get to have a position of leadership in such a country, you are tasked. It's a daunting task. That is the word exactly. It's such a daunting task because you have a lot of responsibilities on your back and you must fulfill them up to task. Uh, let's move to story number, the next story that is on page four of uh, the People Daily. There's actually talking about uh, why Azimio team wants the four CS nominees rejected. That is literally on top, the first uh, highlight of the splash of the People Daily right there. And it goes to say the appointment committee's report will be tabled in the House this afternoon ahead of the debate that is tomorrow. And uh, currently there's intense lobbying as those in the red list seek to ensure to win the support of majority leaders. And then the president has also reportedly made it clear that he is not going to defend anyone. He has done his part and they should do the rest you can see right there on top of your screen why azimio team wants the four cs nominees rejected and the fate of mythika linturi that is moses Kuria, aisha juma penaina malonza in the balance as members of parliaments start debate on their past actions and suitability that's set to happen tomorrow so it's another interesting story as well that you'll be um, taking a look at uh, just briefly, they said the appointments committee chaired by National Assembly, that is Moses Wetangula, reportedly divided over the nomination ahead of the debate and the voting on the names in the House this week. According to a tentative order, the committee's report will be tabled this afternoon ahead of its debate tomorrow. As such, the D-Day when the members of Parliament can either approve or reject the entire list altogether with amendments, of course. And this has also created room for intense lobbying as those in the red list will be seeking to ensure that they win or 
they are rejected. If the House approves the nominees, the acting clerk of the National Assembly, that is Sarah Kiyoko, will inform the president of the decision and the president shall also appoint those who will have been approved formally through a Kenyan Gazette notice. As you can see right there, we have a photo of that, which says National Speaker Moses Wetangula makes a grand entry to Parliament. Tomorrow is the D-Day when members of Parliament will approve or reject the entire list with amendments. The Azmiyo members of Parliament on the other side say it was understood, but however have vowed to mobilize their colleagues to have Linturi's name rejected when the House starts debate on the report tomorrow. And quote-unquote, Azmiyo has a problem with Korea, that is Moses Korea, Mithika Linturi and Juma because of the cases they have, but for Penaina Malonza it was just a small issue with Okambani's member, Okambani member of parliament. So uh, they're trying to actually raise the red flags. I think it's a question that we'll also leave it back at you, back at home for you. Do you feel like the four, the four CSs do not deserve the nominated spots? And if at all they don't, we would like to hear your feedback as well. If they do deserve or they don't, please tell us on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Y254 channel is uh, the social media. And then also you have the hashtag, which is Y254. A uh, Y in the morning, beg your pardon. And um, then another interesting story as well, uh, I think, is on page number six about uh, the Pakistan journalist who was murdered. Uh, that is, uh, Ashad Mohammed in another brown breaking story that is being uh, is, is, is we are we are following it up right here not only just locally but also international media outlets as well is now a national conversation on who exactly killed Ashad Mohammed is it allegedly the special service unit and also next to that page we have a story regarding on that one as a development as well uh, so let me just take you through it. How World Media reported Sharif's death. Kenya trended on Twitter for the better part of yesterday, that, uh, that, that was on Monday, as, uh, as the social media users questioned the killing of Pakistan journalist Ashad Sharif. The trending topic centered on the reasons given by police for the shooting of the popul popular investigative journalist. And in a statement, police spokesman Bruno she also claimed that Sharif had been fatally wounded by a police officer after the car that he was in drove through a roadblock in Magadi Kajado. His death met global headlines with most of the media outlets questioning the explanation. And quote-unquote Al Jazeera, outspoken Pakistan ja uh, journalist Ashad Sharif was killed in Kenya. He was aged 49 years old. He was also, he had fled in Pakistan in August after multiple cases were filed against him for criticizing the military and was shot dead in Kenya. Now, um, the Washington Post said, uh, Washington Post is also a newspaper, uh, a national newspaper that says, a senior Pakistan journalist living in hiding in Kenya was shot and killed by a police officer after the car he was in sped up instead of halting at a roadblock. The police said on Monday that they, they, they expressed regret over the incident, saying it was a case of mistaken identity. The other side, the BBC said an investigation had begun in Kenya after a well-known Pakistan journalist, Ashad Sharif, was shot dead on Sunday. An initial report said officers shot him while he was in a moving vehicle in a case of mistaken identity. And then that is the Hindu terms because he's also of Indian Pakistan resent, a uh, descent, beg your pardon. Ashan Sharif, a top Pakistani journalist hiding in Kenya since he was facing sedition charges, was shot dead on Sunday night. He was reportedly a frequent critic of the Pakistani military establishment and supporters of former Prime Minister Imran Khan, who was ousted in parliament because of no confidence vote in April. So that's how World Media reported that. And uh, down below that, it's a probe launched onto the Pakistan journalist killing. They saying Ashad was a critic of uh, Pakistan, Pakistan's military as well as a vocal supporter of, uh, of ousted uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan in his country. The 49-year-old had left Pakistan in August after complaining of harassment. And then he had previously been in the UK and Dubai before traveling to Kenya. It is, known, it is not known exactly what he was doing in the East African country. 
and then journalist in the Pakistan city of Karachi held a street protest over his killing. And lastly, below that, this is Pakistan's Prime Minister Shez Baz Sharif said Twitter, that is on, on Twitter, he was deeply saddened by the shocking news of uh, Shahz Sharif's tragic death. And then also on matters privacy, his, his wife went to Twitter and said that, you know, he wants uh, netizens or social media users to actually give her and uh, her family and his family privacy by not tweeting the last photos of uh, the deceased uh, uh, last moments so that he, they preserve the dignity of their family and not to tweet about, you know, the family members. So she asked for privacy. I think it was a tweet that also was trending on Twitter. So if you are on social media yesterday, definitely you got a glimpse of that. And then we also had even Kenyan journalists like uh, who, 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 who is this? I've, I've forgotten the name. John Alan Nam, who's, who actually claimed that he was working with him at some point on Twitter. And it, it, it was actually a tirade of, of tweets uh, right there that we were actually you know, being talked about. It was a conversation starter yesterday. Another groundbreaking story that we'll be following up as the day uh, progresses. And then uh, the next story that is on uh, page number seven, it talks about how two Indians and a taxi man met their death. Details have emerged showing how two missing Indians were abducted on Mombasa Road by members of the now disbanded Special Service Unit, never to be seen again. An affidavit filed in the court reveals that the two Indians and their taxi driver were intercepted on Mombasa Road near Ole Sereni Hotel, forced out of the taxi before being bundled into a Subaru vehicle bearing GK number plates by members of the disbanded elite squad before being escorted to the Abadeas National Park. The affidavit as well was filed by Internal Affairs Unit of the National Police Service yesterday, and the investigators also narrate the role played by each of the four police officers implicated in the forceful disappearance of the three persons. According to the investigators, the four officers were not acting alone but were allegedly taking instructions from other persons of interest who remain at large. Investigations have further revealed that the four abducted the two foreigners identified as Zulfikar Ahmad Khan and Mohammed Zaid Sami Kidwai and the taxi driver Nicodemus Moya before dumping them into the national park of the destination on the night of July 22nd and 23rd. The two Indians were in the country for business and commercial purposes before the, dis the disappearance had hired the taxi operator to drive them around. It is alleged that the two had jetted into the country in July to be part of the President Ruto's William, Com President Ruto, or is it escaping me? His doctor, <laughs> to, to top it up, Dr. William Samuel Ruto campaign team. Now, the affidavit also found by Assistant Superintendent of Police Michael Kirui says Mania's taxi was forcefully stopped at the Southern Bypass Interchange, that is at around Ole Sereni by police officers who were arraigned in court yesterday and persons who are still at large. As you can see right there, we have a photo. And uh, the caption is for Special Service Unit Officers Joseph Kamau Mbugwa, John Mwangi Kamau, Francis Mwendo Ndonye, and Peter Mubega Chiku. Those are the guilty police officers right there at the Kahawa locals when they were arraigned yesterday. So um, that's, that's another groundbreaking story that we are taking a look at. And uh, just to summarize it, they say it's uh, only the office of the DPP and uh, the DCI and National Police Service that has allowed in law to file cases against police. And then I remember yesterday we also had a question uh, on that one as well on uh, whether, you know, it, 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 the current regime has actually, you know, come in handy when, you know, it's, it's that time to actually, you know, have some of these, you know, uh, underground, you know, and at large forces to be done away with because previously we have seen a lot of extrajudicial, you know, uh, killings that still continue to unravel even in relation to this current case. And uh, we'll be keeping tabs on that story as it develops. Now, uh, let's move to the business page. On uh, page 16, Martha's business on the business hub that talks about household cutback on savings as inflation bites. 
Uh, definitely, this is regarding the cost of living in the country. You can see right there, households cut back on savings as inflation bites. That means the, the economy still continues to take a nose dive and the cost of living continues to go high. And just a description of that, they say, the annual inflation rate accelerated for the seventh consecutive month to a 9.2% in September. This is last month, okay? And above market focus of 18.6% and the ceiling of the central bank's target range of 2.5% to 7.5%. A hike and increase. And then households are now channeling nearly all their expenses to necessities like food, housing and energy. However, even those have also witnessed some form of the biggest hikes in prices at different points in the past one year. Just to, and, and they're trying to actually give us a little bit of, of the, of hacks right there. They're saying that um, if you want to survive right now, you have to um, embrace recycling habits. This means that, you know, you'll be able to actually, you know, if, if you, if you, if maybe you had food remains, you have to actually, you know, warm them up. Uh, I think there's usually that story of Ugali, like there's no need of dumping Ugali because anyways. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like, I've personally, I've seen someone who like ate ugali the other night and then they used it for breakfast the next day just to survive because the economy is really bad, okay? So you'll do anything to survive as well. That's another interesting story. So uh, down below, they're saying households are channeling uh, a lot of uh, expenses to ensure that they survive. And experts say the amount someone earns while they live and what they buy affects what they can comfortably afford. It also dictates how they can balance their expenses to beat the odds. That's according to uh, the Business Hub, page 16 of the People Daily. And in regarding bank accounts, or those people that have savings, a number also buy household goods in bank to take advantage of discounts, especially offered by supermarkets, while others have to cut down on journeys and reduce the quantity of meals they take as a result of the declining in purchase power and even to serve. Now, uh, they're also talking about a second kg, a second kilogram or two kilograms of maize flour is costing as high as up to 300 Kenya shillings. With more inflationary pressures expected this month due to increase in the prices of electricity, some Kenyans are considering cutting their expenses on perishable food items and electric appliances which require constant energy and preservation. Most consumers of alcoholic beverages say that they have since downgraded their favorite drinks due to the house high, high cost of living. So if uh, story of drinks na mayengs, it's not going to work anymore. Okay. Now, uh, the last page or the last cover of the People Daily on to matter sports, we have Kylian Mbappe, who is uh, the highest paid sports person. He revealed he earns 75 billion Kenya shillings, and that is according to his three years new deal at uh, PSG, that is Paris Saint Germain. And uh, his contract will see the forward, his afford, who will earn over 75 billion Kenya shillings. Wow, quite a huge amount of cash right there. And uh, in three years, according to, he, to the report, the, he's only 23 years old. He signed a new deal with the French champion, champions in the summer when he seemed to have been destined to leave for Real Madrid in the shock of a U-turn that preceded his legal battles and a match of controversy. According to the Le Parisian via the Get French Football News, Mbappe will earn the money in gross salary, which will make him the highest paid sports person ever. And just to just a little glimpse of his scores and his performance, he has scored 164 goals in the 177 games, beg your pardon, that he has played, that is for Paris Saint-Germain, since joining with 130.5 million pounds or euros from Monaco in 2018, netted up to 21 times in 39 appearances on a loan of that Paris in that Paris year and before the deal he made permanently. So 8.6 billion annual gross salary, 21.6 billion signing bonus payable in three terms, 8.4 billion loyalty bonus that is up to 2023 next year, and then with a 9.6 billion loyalty bonus in 2024, with that up to 10.8 billion loyalty bonus in 2025. So 
that means if he's going to uh, stay. But because I think one, one thing about these football uh, clubs is that, you know, once you see you're not doing well in a football club and they're not paying you well, or maybe they're undervaluing you and you're, you're presented with a, better, with a better offer, all you have to do is move. It happens even to professions, you know. So uh, that's just um, a, a summary or a glimpse of uh, what has been making hell or what is still continuing to make headlines on the People Daily newspapers and uh, as we even wait for many other news developments to um, unfold, we'll be keeping tabs right here to bring you up to speed with each and every detail of each and every news development as it unfolds. On that note, we are going to take a short break. You can continue to interact with us on our Y254 channel, that's on Facebook. Instagram and on Twitter as well at Y254 channel and personal at Brian Soko 101. The hashtag is Y in the morning. We take a break. We are back with much more right here. <laughs>